Hello, everybody. This is Paul Taubin with Nine Dot Connects, and I'm glad that you have joined us here today. You are in the right place if you are here for our webinar on symbol naming conventions. So this is going to be a multi-part series uh, because, believe it or not, uh, not one symbol convention will fit all. Uh, so we're going to focus specifically on connectors here today. So before we get started, I'd like to actually kick off with a polling question and uh, just want to see how your libraries are doing at this point. So I will put that up here for you guys to uh, take a look at just to see how, how things are going with you. Okay, so we're going to close the poll over here. So if you can hopefully see the results, 23% uh, of you are in great shape. So one fourth of you attending here today, that's really a great thing. I'm glad to hear that uh, the percentage is, is really that high. I think when we used to do a lot of these webinars in the past, uh, if it, we were happy to even see 10%. So it means a lot of people are starting to put a little more time and energy into the libraries and you're getting them to a place where uh, you're, that you feel comfortable using them, which is great. Uh, the vast majority of you, uh, functional but could be better, I, I get that. Uh, as we have been working with a lot of customers who are trying to improve their libraries, it's just one of those things that it's it's almost a job all its own, pretty much. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad that you're here to take a look at what we ha have to offer you. And we're hoping that by the time this webinar ends, it gives you some idea of how to, at least from the connector point of view, see how you can make the, the naming conventions a little more uh, streamlined uh, for your purposes. And for the 3% of you uh, that have come in with about what libraries, uh, well, that's what Nine Dots all all about here. So after the webinar, if we've convinced you that uh, we might know what, we, what we're actually doing, uh, you can feel free to contact us, and maybe we can help you out um, uh, further at that point. So with that being said, let's jump on over here. A couple of housekeeping notes for you. Uh, feel free to use the panel that you have for questions. I have my two colleagues with me here today in the background. That's uh, Tom Cassidy and Eric Gross. Uh, all three of us uh, went through quite a bit of um, of work on various libraries last year, uh, two large uh, customers that we had to um, assist with. And so uh, all three of us uh, went uh, uh, went through this experience. So even though I'm the one talking, they're just as knowledgeable as I am. So they'll try to answer some questions too. And if there's ones that they care to defer, then that's fine. I'll answer those at the end of the webinar here today. So we will stay on for questions. Uh, just a small disclaimer, some of the footprints that you're going to see here, um, I did modify for demonstration purposes. So what you're seeing on the screen is uh, th there may have been some type of tweak to them, and I just wanted to make that clear um, in case someone sees this later on or somehow they get access to the library that we use to put all this together. Um, I wouldn't trust that library as being a gospel, at least for uh, design purposes. It's really more for the purposes of just de demonstration. So just want to put that out there. And you may even be asking why we talk about footprints if we're talking about symbol naming conventions. But as you'll see here in this presentation today, you've got to know your pin pad relationship in order to come up with a good uh, symbol, which in turn has a huge impact on the name. All right, so what are our objectives for today to show you what we've learned through experience? It's been a wild and crazy 2023. Uh, we, as I said, we had some pretty major customers that we were working through and, and no two customers are ever the same. And so uh, there's a lot of experience that we got when it came to helping them get these libraries in the way and shape and form that they were looking to get them in, All right? And today you'll walk away with a naming convention for connector symbols. Now, everybody always likes to say best practices. I'm, I'm gonna say that these will be better practices because I'm pretty sure you're gonna look at this and say, some of this is pretty good. I can really run with this. Others like, yeah, I don't really need that. So I'm going to say, hopefully, I'm going to give you some better practices today for your connector symbols. And then emphasize the relationship between the pins and the pads. This is a really important thing because, again, if you don't know your pin-pad relationship, your symbols are going to be compromised. So that's, uh, that's why I bring that point up over here. Okay. So the bigger question is, uh, when do we care? Now, it, the, the reason we say when do we care is because it all depends on the type of library that you have. So there are component-centric libraries and there are symbol-centric libraries. So let's talk about those for a moment here. I know we've talked about them in webinars in the past, and this is really our nomenclature uh, when you say component-centric or symbol-centric libraries, but it's really important to understand the difference between the two, uh, especially for what we're gonna talk about here today, but also just in general because if you're familiar or you're new with, not let's say not so much familiar with, with Altium, but you're new to Altium Designer, and you'll go on webinar and you'll see this thing, and then you go to webinar and see that thing, you're like, wait a minute, they did two different things, and yet they're claiming to be the same. Why is that? Because probably it depends on the type of library that you're using. So let's take a look at this for a moment. So a component-centric library usually consists of three types of files, or at least a database and two separate files. So you have a component 
file, which is the definition of your name, your description, your parametric information, which defines the component. And it has a link to a symbol graphic and has a link to a footprint graphic. So what uses this? Pretty much any database that you're using, whether it's Excel, uh, most people, we use Excel quite a bit as temporary databases to get information to migrate from one place to another, but Excel can be used as a database. I would not lean on this too much if you got two or more people, but it can work as a database. Uh, and anything from Access, L9, which is our product, Arena, et cetera, you know, any, even the largest databases to Excel, it's a database and this is the format that it's going to use. And of course, if you're using Altium, Altium's documentation products, A365, Concord Pro, Nexus Enterprise, I don't care what they call it this week, it's all the same code base, okay? It's all component, it's a component symbol, uh, basically a component-centric library. Now, if you're kind of new to Altium and you're just kind of taking it out of the box, or you're kind of old school where all the libraries always started in the symbol-centric library, this is what it looks like. And so a symbol-centric library is a library that is uh, based, it's a symbol, schlib. It contains the graphic, it contains the parametric data that defines the component, like the name of the component, the manufacturer's name, and, uh, and the parametric data that's associated with it. And then there's a link to the footprint, okay? Um, and so this is uh, the symbol-centric library. So where are you gonna find these? Well, if you are creating classic SCH slash PCB libraries, this is a simple centric library. And then there's also an integrated library. And the, a lot of people get this kind of twisted up here, but just as a quick reminder, integrated library is nothing more than compiling your SCH lib and your PCB lib from an ASCII format into a binary format. Okay, that's really all it's doing for you. So it just allows you one file rather than dealing with two uh, separate files. Okay, so. With that being said, let me talk first about symbol-centric component naming conventions. Now, I know that the title of this webinar is about naming connector symbols, but if you're using a symbol-centric library, well, your symbol name is your component name. And in a symbol library, symbol-centric library, that is, you're gonna have to, you have to have a unique name. So that's that's kind of why I need to bring this up here first, okay? So in a symbol-centric component name, is the symbol name, okay? Again, symbol-centric and component-centric, we, we can talk about that. We'll spend a lot of time talking about that, but the, the idea here with the symbol-centric is your name has to be, your, your symbol name is your component name, which means it has to be unique, okay? So here's the format that we're recommending. Again, is it the best practice for you? It might be, if you can think of other ways of changing this around, feel free to do so. At the end of the day, this name has to be unique, Right, in order for you to um, use it in a symbol centric environment. So what is it? General comp uh, component category, a position number, which we will talk more about position numbers here in just a moment, a purpose category, because there are sub purposes for different connectors, which you'll see here throughout the webinar, and then a manufacturer's name and a manufacturer's part number. But of course, let's take a look at an example and this will make a little more sense. So what you see over here is a prefix. So this prefix is really useful for sorting purposes. So anything that's a connector in your library, if you put this prefix, whether it's C-O-N-N or C-O-N, right? Something that indicate that these are connectors, especially if you're keeping everything in one single file, this is a nice way of being able to sort it. The second thing that we do is the position number, and we'll talk a little more about position numbers here, but you put the position number in here. So again, it helps with sortability. The third part that you see over here is the purpose category. So you can put a word in there generic if it's HDMI or some other type of specifically uh, de developed protocol, USB, HDMI, um, SD card, micro SD, whatever those things might be, those type of connectors, you can call that out over here. And then again, you have to have something that's unique. You can certainly do the manufacturer's part number, but I'm a big fan of also putting the manufacturer's name in there as well. Uh, because again, for sortability and to look back at what you might have. So can I reuse something again in the symbol library? Uh, by putting this all together, this should be a, a pretty good way to not only sort, but to find things you've done before. Because let's face it, the name of the game, a lot of times when you're trying to keep things consistent is copy and paste. So if I have this over here, but I'm creating another component that's very similar to this, well, how can I copy this information? Well, one of them, is to clone an existing one and then change its name and parameters, right? Because the symbol is gonna look the same for these. Like if I have another eight, eight pin components from TE, for example, or from AMP, right? Okay, the, the name's gonna change, but the beginning part's gonna be the same here. So I can easily 
you know, clone this one and then give it the, the appropriate manufacturer's name, manufacturer's part number. The second thing I could do is just create a brand new component and then copy the primitives uh, from it. So I can create a new one, but then go into this one, copy its primitives, and then bring it back into my new component. So that's kind of the naming convention that we would recommend. And what you're going to see here, and I, and I encourage those who are using simple centric libraries, don't just drop off at this point. Take a look at what we're doing here, because there may be a few other things you may want to add, uh, if not to the name itself, to maybe to the description that can uh, further clarify some of these things for you. Okay. All right, let's talk about the component centric symbol naming convention. So we've already looked at this over here. So for component centric libraries, the name of the game, well, let's just talk about this first and we'll talk about the name of the game after that. The component name is separate from the symbol name. So unlike the, the symbol centric library we just talked about where the symbol, the component name is the symbol name, actually the symbol name is separate from the component name. So some people ask, look, what do you recommend for a component name? This question comes up quite often when we're working with customers who are trying to get their libraries together in, a, like, in something like A365. And for the most part, a component name, fortunately, could be anything you want because you can have duplicate component names uh, in the system. You can easily get away with the manufacturer's name uh, part number. But again, I'm a big fan of the manufacturer's name underscore manufacturer's part number for a component name. But uh, that's, that's the component name. But let's talk about the symbol, though. So the symbol name, this is the name of the game here. The symbol name is generic for different components of the same category. So the intention over here is to reuse the same symbol over and over again. So for example, in a symbol centric library, which we talked about in the prior slide, if I have a thousand resistors, I've got to copy and paste that same graphic in each one of them. So I, I can't just point it to one and say, okay, use this. Now in a component centric library, I can have 10,000 resistors and they, yet they all point to the exact same symbol to be used every single time, right? Uh, and so that's the power of this is that I don't have to keep redrawing it or copy and pasting uh, the graphics of the symbol each and every single time I create another resistor component. I just point it to the one that I need. And if you're kind of get, if you're in the symbol centric library and trying to get your head wrapped around it, think about a footprint, right? In a footprint, we can use that 0402 over and over and over again. That's the same idea here uh, in these component sim, uh, sim reuse the symbol over and over again. So consistency, and this is the, the big word, right? This has always been the thing about libraries. Consistency um, allows for convenient sorting, right? Consistency should be in every aspect of it, and that's probably the hardest part of all libraries is just simply consistency since there's so many little aspects of it to, to maintain. But uh, remember, and I'm going to just keep driving this point home, we're not labeling the component. We're labeling the symbol in a component-centric uh, library. Okay. All right. So let's throw a polling question at you over here um, just to kind of, we're going to start looking at some naming conventions, but um, plastic mounting pins. Okay. Now, how should plastic mounting pins uh, be included in the component? So if you had take a moment there, uh, uh, see which one you think it might be. Okay. So we're going to close the poll over here. So if you said C, that's generally correct. Okay, and so the reason why we would say for the footprint only is because obviously if you have mounting pins, it has to be reflected in the footprint. But in a um, in a symbol, okay, those sim the those pins are electrical, and so Altium is exp is trying to build an electrical netlist for you. So for our purposes here, what you're going to see is that we do not include plastic mounting pins as a pin in the symbol. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about pin names pin numbers and pad numbers, okay? So here's here's an example of a 10 pin uh, component. So it's got a symbol here, okay? Uh, we've got, this is an actual example of one. You'll see this a couple more times because I like this because it, it emphasizes a few uh, features that we need to look at. Uh, you can see here is its footprint. So it's footprint, you've got two mounting holes, all right? Um, and so um, you'll notice that these mounting holes are for plastic pins. Right. And so, yes, we have to have them on the footprint, but there's no reason to add these on over here. We can't electrically connect to them. So let, let's not give people the false impression that those pins are electrical. All right. Uh, in terms of names and designator, I do put this over here because you'll notice that with every single pin, there is a name and there is a designator. Let's talk about those in a, for a moment. So each pin has a name and a, and a number property to it. And most of the time we call them pin numbers. And I have to admit, I fall into that nomenclature all the time, but the official term of it is a designator, okay? And the pin number is the pin designator, as I just mentioned. 
and the pin number, or again, pin designator, corresponds to a pad number. And this is a really important thing uh, because in the end, uh, we wanna make sure we do have a pin pad relationship. So if there's a different numbering scheme that we're using here, and there are different numbering schemes that can be used, you'll see an example here in a little bit. All right, we wanna make sure that that gets properly reflected here in the, uh, in the footprint. Okay. And by the way, these mounting holes, this mounting hole here and this one here are both, uh, they are both pad properties. So um, what, what I'll mention over here, and I'll see this in the next slide, we'll see this next slide. If you're changing the pin number, uh, check the corresponding pad number. Okay, so make sure if for some reason, if you're gonna change these, is your footprint gonna correspond? If not, Altium's gonna throw a flag. Uh, and changing the pin name has no effect on the pad. Now you'll notice something here that we didn't turn on the pin names for the generic uh, components. There's no reason to turn them on because all it's gonna do is just show the duplicate number. Um, so it, it doesn't really make sense to do that. Now, it, again, what I'm showing over here is I'll say is better practices, not necessarily best practices. If you're saying like, look, I, I know the designator and the name for these generic components are both um, the, the, the same number, right? Um, and I wanna show the name rather than the, um, the I wanna show the name inside the box rather than the, uh, than the designator, you can certainly do that, all right? There's no, nothing that stops you from doing that. But the designator at the end of the day has to match up with the pad number that's associated with it. If you do change the pin name, it has no effect on the pad. So for example, if someone spelled out ground and you say, well, that's kind of silly, I want it to be GND, then okay, you can change that, but it'll have no impact on the pin pad relationship. And it's okay to have more pads and pins. And this was kind of the point I was trying to get to here from the last slide that yes, I have these two pads in here, they're both through hole, so, and they, they represent that, uh, that plastic, those plastic pins, but I don't have to represent them here. And I did use some experiments with it, Altium doesn't care, it's not gonna squawk. The only times it's gonna squawk is if you have more pins in your schematic than you have footprints, okay? But if you have more, and it makes sense, right? Because if you have, a, let's say a thousand pin FPGA, you know that well, at least 50 of those pins are probably no connects. Right, and so so Altium recognizes that you're going to always have more pads and pins in many cases here. So Altium's okay with that. It's just when you go into the opposite situation of more pins and pads, that's going to be problematic. And yes, as right over here, it's not okay to have more pins than pads. Okay, let's talk about J versus P connectors. Uh, pardon me, designators. This is this one really twists a lot of people up, and it even caught me for a little bit until I really started understanding what the J versus P is, because most of us think of J and P based on um, or, uh, sexual orientation of the uh, of, of the connector, right? Is it male or is it female? And that not, has nothing to do with it, okay? Or because it's a plug or it's a socket, and we may think of a plug as being male and a socket as being female. It has nothing to do with it. Really what it is, is that the J designator is to be used for mounted connectors, which quite frankly, for most of us is gonna be 99% of the time. Okay, so anything that you are mounting, whether you're mounting into a wall, you're mounting into a system, or you're mounting on a printed circuit board, it is a J designator. So hopefully that just made your life a whole lot easier rather than trying to twist your head around, is this really a J or is this a P, okay? Um, and there, there you go, this is a great example of this, right? Now, they don't necessarily have to be through hole, by the way, they can be surface mount, but the intention is, is that if you're gonna mount this onto a printed circuit board, then this is a J designator, okay? And uh, connectors mounted on the board are considered to be jacks. And I was kind of thinking about this as to why we get this all kind of, or get ourselves kind of wound around the apps, uh, actual about this. And that's because at least here in the States, uh, there's a number of different ways of us saying uh, jacks, right? We, we call them sockets, we call them outlets. Um, oddly enough, uh, everything's, when it comes to telephones, if you have the old landlines, what do we do? We plug it into a phone jack, right? And yet really, uh, when it comes to this designator, anything that's mounted is considered to be a jack. So P obviously stands for plug, or hopefully it makes makes more sense it stands for plug here. And so yes, this one over here, this connector that you see where my cursor is at the bottom of the screen is connected to a cable. And that's the easiest way to think of it is that if you're connecting to a cable, this is going to be a plug. If you're going to mount it on something that's rigid, it's going to be um, it's going to be um, a a jack. Now I'm pretty sure some of you are thinking about well, what about flex rigid? I would still consider that to be a jack, okay? Because it, most of the time it's either gonna be placed onto um, the rigid side of the board or the flex side of the board. Uh, so I would, I would still consider it to be a jack, okay? And as the name suggests, the connector's on a cable. P 
pin versus position. This got kind of interesting for us because originally we started coming up with a naming convention. We talk about the number of pins, but you may have noticed at the very beginning, we never said pins, we said positions. Okay. Um, so why did we not? So initially when we talked about everything up to this point in the webinar, let me just take a step back. Everything we talked about in this point in the webinar, when I've talked about pins, I've been talking about them in context of the pin primitive in Altium Designer. So pin pad relationship, because we're talking about a pin primitive matching up with a pad primitive in Altium. But when it comes to the naming convention, the term pin is not a good term to be using. Now, why is that? Because it, again, it talks about whether it is male or female. All right, so let's take a look at this over here. All right, so the term position allows for the naming of pins or holes without having to differentiate between the two. Okay. And uh, and that's kind of why we had to move. We originally, we were talking about pins, but then questions came up when we were coming up with the naming convention about, well, what if it looks like this, where it's got all holes in it? It's, are you really talking about a pin or not? And so we said, okay, let, let's move away from that. Let's just call it the number of positions when it comes to the naming convention. All right. And so for similar names, we'll be using the term position, or in this case, POS. And we do recognize this abbreviation has become an unfortunate acronym in, in sleet, uh, you know, on texting and uh, street slang. Uh, but hopefully we can get beyond that and just recognize that it's a position and that's one of the abbreviations that we use in the symbol naming convention. And we will show examples if you wish to differentiate the pins from the holes. So here's just a little preview of that. So for, mo for most of our, for pretty much our customers, this was perfectly fine for them. They just wanted to have some type of uh, representation of the pins as, as they relate to the connector. But yes, if you're saying like, no, I really need to know if this is male or female or hermaphrodite, like this example over here, and there isn't a real part that looks like this, uh, then you know you can you will show you a naming convention that will work for that purpose. Okay. All right. So the naming convention prior to the beginning, our recommendation, pardon me, our recommendation is to have a style guide uh, to maintain consistency. Here, in fact, at 9.connects, anytime we engage with the customer, the first meeting that we practically have with them is, hey, um, here's our template style guide. Let's change this to make sure that we know what you want us to do. And we do that for them, whether uh, we're doing a restoration project, project where we're trying to basically clean up their symbols and get their libraries together again, or if they're saying, hey, we're trying to just sustain our libraries. If you can help us make a few parts, that would really help us out. We need to know the style guide because no two customers ever do the same thing. Um, we can provide recommendations, but in the end, every customer seems to have their own variance and way of doing things, which is which is great, right? Variety is the spice of life, but we have to have the style guides to know what we're doing when they ask us for a, a part. So here's the other thing too, it's kind of an escape hatch. And so when in doubt, the name can reflect the manufacturer's pin number and or manufacturer's name. So when we were coming up with these, these nomenclatures for various symbol names, we wanted to have something that was in the middle. We, we knew if we were too short with it, then we could paint ourselves into a corner, meaning that we could have two different things, but the naming convention did not allow us to differentiate those. So we wanted to avoid that. But at the same time, we didn't want to have a naming uh, convention that basically is a paragraph for every single name, because the more and more characters you add to something, the more problematic it might uh, become right because when you start hitting that 256 character limit, uh, it, something along the line is going to possibly break. If it's not necessarily an Altium, it might break in 8365. It's not 365. It may be one of the uh, generators of some of your documentation. So the intention is to come up with a name that is um, adequate to uh, cover and to provide uniqueness to that uh, component, but to not paint yourself into a corner. All right. So let's get on to it. What's the following structure? So here it is. It should look very similar to you because a lot of it comes, uh, what we did for the symbol centric is also basically what we did for the component centric here. But keep in mind that again, uh, symbol centric, we have to be unique. That's why you always should add in manufacturer's name, manufacturer part number. Here we're trying to reuse these over and over again. So we want something that adequately describes it, but again, not makes it so unique that I've got to create a, a different one each and every single time. So category type, subcategory type, number of positions, and orientation details. Where, uh, again, you see CONN for the sort purposes. The category type could be HDMI, USB, generic. What you are going to see with us, though, is we don't normally leave the generic in there because it's kind of understood that if I immediately go to the number of positions, then that connector is generic. The number of positions. So, again, it doesn't matter if it's holes or pins, but we're not including any type of mounting holes 
or uh, shields uh, to this, all right? And then lastly, any type of orientation detail, such as um, the staggering of the pins uh, or the shield uh, the shield pins, those type of things. We, we do want to call those things out because some of them don't have it and some of them do have it. And we want to make sure that we're, uh, that people when they're using that symbol know what they're getting uh, with, with that symbol, okay? All right, so let's take a look at some examples over here. So we, we want to start off with probably the most fundamental one, which is a single row. Uh, nothing in terms of shields or anything else about it. It's just a single row of, of pins over here. So here's the, uh, here's the nomenclature we've got. We use, again, the prefix connector, the number of positions, and the fact that it's one row. So what we, didn't, what we did leave out, again, is the term generic. We didn't see a need to necessarily put that in there. Now, if you've got a really large library, that might be um, of value to you. Uh, but for anything that we had generic, we just immediately went to the number of positions. Now, you may have also noticed, and I mentioned this earlier at the webin beginning of the webinar, but I want to mention this here now and talk about this. So what we did, we, we talked to this particular customer, and all the, all the connectors that they had were less than 1,000 pins. Okay, so what we want to do is to ensure sortability, so we put in placeholders. So this is what this looks like. In a moment, I'll show you a slide what it really looks like. It's pretty cool, and it makes for a very clean sort order. So that's what we did here. Again, positions, because we don't want to necessarily call out whether these were pins or holes. I mean, in this case, they're all pins, but we didn't want to get down into the, um, the orientations of those, uh, of those electrical, uh, of, of the pin or the, or the hole. And then lastly, the, the fact that it's one row. So what do we do? We basically take the name here, we'd copy it into the comment, and then over here in the description, we would spell it out just a little bit more, okay? And this is true, by the way, for the uh, symbol-centric. For the symbol-centric, you may also want to put some other details in here, but this, this works just well for the, the uh, symbol-centric components, uh, at least the description element of it. And here's an example of the sorting. So you can see all these different parts that we had here. This is a small co collection of those. And once we get out beyond the the uh, generic ones and we start getting into these other specific ones that we've got here. And we'll talk about those here a little bit as we're going along, but just to give you an idea of the sort order. Okay. So uh, a lot of times we use components that have two rows in it. So let's take a look at this one here. So this is connector 10 positions again. The difference is that now it has two rows, but notice it has no stagger. So if it does stagger between left and right, then we would actually put a stagger in the the naming convention here. And again, because these are plastic tips on these, we don't show any type of mounting hole um, on this. We just simply show the electrical pins. Now, another way to take a look at this too is you may want to break these up. And this happens quite often when you've got really large connectors where like, let's say it's 150 pins. And so you've got 50 pins you know, uh, per row. Then you can certainly break those up, but you do need to have a nomenclature to indicate that. So I basically what I did here was I took the 10 pin, which you just saw a moment ago. So everything here stays the same. It's 10 positions, two rows. Just that now, because I've got a multi-part component or what Altium calls parts, uh, then I want to make that clear over here that this has been broken up. Now, if I needed to, because the rows aren't, let's say the same number of pins, I could probably put a little more detail in here to indicate what uh, pins I've got here, or the number of pins I've got for each one of the rows. But I figured since they're equal number, I, just by saying that they're multi, was probably good enough to differentiate this out. Okay, so now let's get into an example of a stagger. So pretty much this is when you start going back and forth, up and down, uh, you know, from the bottom, if you're starting at the bottom left to the top, then back to the bottom to the top again, which is what you can see here on the footprint. So in this case, we would put the indication of a stagger in there. Sometimes you get a Samtech part, Samtech part and Samtech does their own naming conventions because a lot of times they're custom. So again, everything stays the same here. There was 10 pins, two row, and it was a stagger, but we had to indicate that the numbering convention was different from what um, we normally use here. So we said two placeholders. And now what happens when we start getting into shields? So I did a little bit of research on this because I have to admit mounting pins and shields, there's a blur, blurred line between these two, and you probably have come up across this before. But what I can see with the shield is obviously it's metal and it's there to either prevent the connector from radiating out or preventing signals from elsewhere from radiating in. So it's gonna be of a metal nature here. And of course, if it is metal, then at that point, you would want to be able to have some type of electrical connectivity to it. I mean, 99% of the time, you're probably gonna put it to some type of ground, but you never know, 
right? But uh, so that these pins should be available to you at this point since they are metal. And this is our convention up here. So pretty much everything stayed the same that you've seen already. It's just now we're introducing um, SHLD. Could you spell out shield completely? Certainly feel free to do so. Uh, and what we did was if we had a number, like in this case, there was four of them, we just put the number after that. And you'll see this kind of uh, convention again, show up uh, throughout the next examples that we have. Uh, here's an example of not only a multi, but an alpha prefix. And this again, becomes more common when you start getting into the much larger uh, components. So here's an example of a 30 pin, three row. Again, we do break them up into three separate parts and we have to indicate that there is an A in front of it. Um, it, you can't see these very well, but if you were to zoom in on these, I guess we probably should have done that when we took the shot over here, you'd see A1, A2, A3, et cetera, et cetera, because um, there's a pin pad correlation between them. So that's how we would indicate that we have an alpha prefix. Now, again, if you may come up and say, well, I would just said alpha, and that's okay, right? So again, it's, it's how you can turn this into uh, making it work for your, your libraries. Um, I got a question for you. So now that I've shown you a couple examples over here, let's see if we um, if what we've told you here kind of makes some sense. So I'm going to show you this. Hopefully you can see this uh, 20 pin component. All right. And so uh, what would be the naming convention for a 20 position double row staggered connector? So we'll open that poll up here for you. Okay. So the results are in. So the vast majority of you did get it correct. This would be a connector 20 position two row stagger for the, the I know a couple of you did do the um, the 20 pin and uh, again we're trying to stay away from the term pin now, I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do it's just for us if we start talking about pins we're talking about um, most of the time we're talking about a male element of the connector whereas position just allows us to say whether it's it's a generic way of saying whether it's a, a pin or a hole so all right guys thanks for answering that question so let's look at a couple of other ones out over here because not everything's a generic connector. So here's some examples of some BNCs. So again, connector, now we get into actually designating a, a term to this, so BNC. And what we found worked for this was like center or outer on this here. So, so you can see center one, outer two. And we had to do this because believe it or not, these things do get switched around. And in other cases, you'll see things like this where you've got out, center one and you've got two pins out uh, for the outer part of the uh, the BNC. Here's one that's actually got four of them out there. Okay, So that was how we, we worked that nomenclature for BNCs. And by the way, that would work for us. This would work for SMAs as well. Um, and so then you have um, an S, which is now your, uh, this is an example of someone didn't use numbers. Instead, they used um, the S, which probably was like the source, and then G over here being the ground. Okay, So there's another way of doing it as well. Ah, DB connectors. DB connectors were a lot of fun because this is where actually we started getting into this idea of positions versus pins versus uh, holes. Because you, you know, you, the, if you've dealt with DB connectors, uh, you have to be very careful because if you're dealing with all holes, like this example over here, the pin one orientation is different from what you'd use if they're all pins, right? So there has to be a correlation or correspondence in the DB protocol, if you wish to call it that, uh, it has that type of orientation established. So this is uh, a DB connector, which uh, has 15 pins to it. So you can see over here, the connector, you, you indicate with DB, but a lot of times, and this has just been traditional with, with DB connectors, you immediately put the number of pins right after it. So we kept to that nomenclature. And then you've got to determine, you know, tell it whether it's female or male, because again, the orientation plays a role in this. And then ultimately how many mounting pins that you've got here, okay. Uh, so for what we did, and you'll see this here in a moment, you'll see the difference between them. If it was a hole, then we'd basically put, uh, we wouldn't fill it. So here you can see this would be the um, uh, uh, a DB connector that is female as opposed to one that is male. So this is here is a, a male a DB connector. So let's take a look at this one here. So there was this was an interesting one. So again, we had to come up with a little bit of a nomenclature. And later on, we had to come up with the USB one that had a similar situation. So if it had a double like this, we, we said, okay, it's a times two. So we put this little indication in there. It is male, there's two mounting holes to it. And of course the DB, the, the number of pins is shown in the DB9, okay. Now in this case over here too, the, these um, pins were labeled with uh, a, you know, a through, A1 through basically A9 and B1 through B9, just to differentiate whether those pins were going to the, you know, the top or the bottom connector. 
Now you could have argued, someone could have said, well, can't you just simply use like a multi, uh, couldn't you just use the multi which you used on other ones before? And our argument to this one was that um, you could have used the multi, but the intention of the multi was that it was still one connector head with just different rows, where this one really is two separate connector heads. So that's why we, we did this the way we did it. These are just some other examples of ones. We did a, quite a few of these DB uh, connectors, and so they were kind of fun to put together after we figured out how to make this uh, work in terms of the naming convention and how um, and the orientations that we needed. But again, here's a male one. So if it's male, it's got to be, uh, pin one's got to be on the left, at least if you're looking down on it. Okay, and some just larger ones and even larger ones and even larger ones. <laughs> so, um, but they all follow the same convention. All right. So what about DC jacks? Even those got a little bit interesting. So uh, DC jacks, you got your connector. DC jack is your basically your subcategory here, your tip, your sleeve, and your shunt. And again, you put the pin number after that because yes, they do change depending on which ones you get. So here's one where the uh, the numbers were this way. And then if you change these, you, you saw that they completely changed them around. So we wanted to keep this as uh, consistent as possible. And just the only thing we change is the pin numbers. All right, now we get into the fun things of when you start getting into things like, um, the, the, I'll call them the, the protocol connectors, right? Your HDMIs, your compact flashes, your USBs, and all the like. So those you do want to call out because people are going to look for those. So that should be your, your second name after your connector. Again, put the number of positions in here because this does help because there might be another compact flash that doesn't use 50 positions. All right, and so by putting this position in over here, if someone does come up with another one that's a little bit different, right, then then you have an ability, you have an out with that. So you can say, okay, well, that one's really a 48 position. I'm just making that up. But the, the intention is to show you that by doing this over here, I can create another one, and now I don't have some type of conflict because um, if I just call the compact flash, and there was another one that came up, and one was 40 pins, and the other one's 50 pins, I'm going to have a problem with that. So I don't want to paint myself into a corner. And in this case, uh, four shields. And that's how we called out the compact flash here. Now there is another difference you may have noticed here too. This is the first time in which we invoke a name. So on a generic connector, we generally don't invoke names. And if you are gonna name it, right, on a generic connector, th that's, that naming convention is gonna come from the net list. But when you're dealing with something that has, there's a known protocol to it, right, uh, there are standard to it, then at that point, you can definitely call out the names. And in fact, if anything, I would encourage that because it'll make it a lot easier to, um, you know, to help uh, design it, you know, design your board and to connect things up appropriately. So there's an example of that. Here's an example of an HDMI. So here again, we've got um, the connector, HDMI, the number of positions, uh, and the four shields that we've got over here. And by the way, when I looked at this, because when I first saw this, I, I was like, well, are these plastic? And it's actually a copper alloy, so this is metal. So therefore, these four pins uh, that they've got over here are um, are are metal. But there are two plastic pins underneath this, so that's why we don't call out those mounting holes. Uh, here we go with an SD uh, micro SD, so eight pins with uh, four shields. Again, in this case, they don't necessarily have mounting holes. All of these are surface surface mount. And then we got to USB. USB gets a little bit interesting because uh, there, there are four pin and there are five pin varieties of this. So here we go. You can see again, we're just following the same conventions you've seen already in the other slides here. But there are five positions where there, there's a fourth pin. The, the fifth pin is like an ID. So on the traditional ones, you would go from a one to a four and then there's an ID pin. So pin four becomes the ID and pin five becomes the ground. And then again, you've got your shields here. All right, and there's just different flavors of these that you can see as we're going about here. Uh, so here is your double again. So you have your uh, it was a four position. This one um, we probably we well now let's see it over here. It's always amazing how you find these little things as you're looking about it. This one probably should have been an 004 position if we're keeping with our nomenclature here, but it is times two, uh, and it's four shields. Now, what happens when you get into something like this? So again, you, a lot of times you can purchase these things from Samtech, and you can call out the shots as to what, how many you know, pins you actually want populated versus the ones you don't want populated. So when you get into a situation like this, this is where uh, our recommendation is that you say connector, something that says or indicates custom. 
and immediately then when you get into custom, put in a manufacturer's name, manufacturer's part number. Now this could actually be uh, that part that you're purchasing from the manufacturer, or it could be your company's name and your manufacturing a part number that you have a, a company part number that you have associated with it. Okay, so it uh, depends on how you're working things in your company here. And then the rest of this information should be uh, filled out as well. The one thing we added to this, for example, is no connects. So we're showing that from three to 18, there's no connects associated with it. Now, I, again, this is really a simple naming convention webinar, but you may say like, well, what about all the pads that are associated with it? So what we did here is we, we did include the pads in here, but we just basically put them on mechanical one just to, so to show that they are there at the same time, uh, not necessarily have them available on the copper layer. Now, I mentioned earlier on, if you really wanna get into um, determining whether it's male or female, this is the convention that we were using, just putting these little dots, either we were filling them in if they're male or we're leaving them uh, unfilled if they were female. And all we did over here is just add in the fact that they were male or female. And for the most part, that's what you're gonna have if you know if you've got something that's going to have all pins or it's going to have all holes in it. But what about the hermaphrodite parts? Well, here's an example of that, and this is a real part from Samtech where you know one row is actually uh, a, a holes and the other ones are actually pins uh, here. Okay, so what we did with this is we indicated that it was hermaphrodite, and then for male we said even, and for the um, female we said odd. Now if, it, if the numbers are a little bit different here, we'd probably have to spell out what numbers we actually had here, but it was convenient enough for us to do this particular nomenclature. So that's how we came up with that one there, okay? So um, I've covered all of the various uh, things that we've got here uh, for, for, the, um, uh, for the different type of connectors we come across. Uh, now that uh, you've seen it, just want to know what's the likelihood of you implementing it. Okay, so looking at the results here, very interesting spread. Um, and so, so for those 33% or use it as soon as practical, we'll make sure that this the, this recording is uh, posted here probably in the next uh, 48 to 72 hours. Uh, so we we will de definitely get that out there for you guys to take a look at. So if you missed any notes or you want to look at things again, we'll have it there. Um, I'm glad that a lot of you already have a really good convention. I'm, I'm be curious to know uh, whether or not uh, it, we're similar to what you're doing or what you're doing uh, differently, because uh, I'm always looking for other practices. You know, these are the ones that ultimately came up for our purposes based on the customer's needs. But um, if you've got other ones or things that you're doing, I'd be kind of curious to see those. Uh, for those 19% who don't like to but don't have the time, I get it. And hopefully here in a couple of minutes when we talk about 9.connects, uh, you might be able to uh, use our services to po possibly help you implement it. And for the 3% who didn't show, I, I don't know, hopefully it was because you were just humoring me by the, the comment we made about the donuts. But, um, uh, you know, uh, anyways, thank you for your time. Uh, so uh, we'll move over here to one more polling question. And what did you think of the webinar? So if you can take a moment to answer that. Okay, so we got our results in. So um, you guys are pretty happy with it. I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I get it that some of you guys uh, probably you know, said like, hey, this was pretty cool, but probably not your cup of tea. So I, but again, I appreciate you attending the webinar. Okay, let me. if you know, guys don't mind, I'd like to talk a few minutes about 9.connects. You are here for a reason, to find a better, if not best practices for naming conventions of connectors or symbols in general. Uh, trying to make order out of the chaos in your libraries. And let's face it, libraries are not an easy thing to keep up. And I think a lot of you are probably here because you're putting in that effort uh, to uh, keep those libraries up and going, or you have a desire to do so. And, or you are just simply looking to build a better library. Okay. So it's been a while since we've talked with everybody, had a webinar. So we'd like to just kind of quickly over give you an overview of the major services that we provide here at 9.connects. So PCB design. We love the ugly stuff. Send it to us. Let's take a look at it, right? Let's see if what you're doing is even doable. But uh, if it's DDR, high speed flex, we'd be interested in it. Let's, let's take a look at what you got if uh, you need some help with that type of stuff. We also do training as well. We have our PCB Foundations class. Here's our book over here, uh, which, by the way, is available on Amazon if you don't want to be in the four-day class. But the PCB Foundations class, actually, I believe it's three days, but um, the class is a, fund, uh, is a foundational class, meaning that it's there for the technicians, it's for the engineers, it's for the uh, program managers, even for purchasers, anybody who's involved in the process of, of the PCB design. Uh, this is a really important 
uh, class that we put together uh, because if you, uh, as we've said in the past and I'm going to keep reiterating it if you don't control the process it's going to control you and so that's why we put this out there um, and um, I'll do a little bit of bragging over here we have a lot of government agencies that take this class because they, they really want to make sure that uh, when they're talking to their customers or if they're building stuff uh, that they're not um, doing cost overruns and those type of things so uh, it's it's a pretty popular class amongst them um, Altium Designer Full Spectrum Training. This is another great class that we do. Yes, Altium also provides a training. We provide a training too. There is a fundamental difference between the two. So at Altium, they're going to teach you how to use the tool. They're going to show you how to push the tool, which is great. But with us, obviously, we're going to teach you to use the tool, but we do it from a, a project perspective. What do you need to do to get through your project? And the other training that we do here is Altium 365. This is a different creature, and the reason it's different is because unlike these other classes where we work with you for three or four days straight, uh, we uh, with the A365, if you are to work with us, it's a team effort. So a lot of times we'll meet online for an hour or two, we'll talk about a certain concept, uh, give a homework assignment, and then we meet again once you guys have uh, the, the 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 customer has figured out what they they want to do. Because um, if we did it in three days or four days. A, you'll forget it, and B, even if you implement it, no, if you don't have buy-in, no one's going to use it. So you have to take everybody step by step through things, and there has to be team consensus in order for Altium 365 to be successfully set up. And then the other thing, libraries, which is where we spend a great deal of our time these days. Uh, we're doing some really great, amazing things with them, and we'll continue to talk about them. Restoration, creation, and migration. Um, so people who have libraries or barely have libraries, we can pull them together. Um, you know, creation again from we we had one customer a couple of years ago where they really had no library, um, so we had to take basically their their bomb data dumps, uh, their their entire purchasing system, their design their designs and extract out components and pull them all together. So it's quite an endeavor, but we are able to do it. And of course, of course, ultimately migration to the endpoint, which is usually A365, but it could be a database as well. And then post you know, creation or just librarian services. After you've, we've created or a customer has it, but they're like, well, I'm sick and tired of dealing with these libraries. Let's get someone who knows what they're doing. So we just have to request them and they'll take care of it. And we do this for several customers of ours here. So librarian services as well. So in conclusion, thank you so much for uh, joining me here for this webinar today. And if you can give me a moment, I'm gonna take a look at uh, some questions to see if there's anything I need to answer.